Well, happy Good Friday to you. Thank you for tuning in and um, joining us for a celebration for Good Friday. When I approach Good Friday, I always find myself um, bringing in two very different emotions that I think are both very important. Number one is that we're, we're mourning a death, an unjust death for someone who is sinless and without blame, who is um, painfully and shamefully put to death um, in a sinner's way. But then we also realize that this is a, a moment to um, joyfully rejoice about because our salvation was accomplished on the cross by the blood of Jesus Christ, the, pot, the, the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And without the cross, there is no redemption. There is no remission of sin without the blood that was shed on the cross. And so this, this um, video here that you joined me for is just going to be a reflection of what Christ has done and both a morning and a celebration. And so my prayer is just that as you watch this and as you um, sing along and are encouraged by the words that you hear, that you will just remember that Christ um, came to take away the sin of the world on the cross and he accomplished that with uh, every second of it. So one thing that I think is super important to also remember and to point out is that um, Jesus gave his life willfully. When he stands before Pilate in John 19, Pilate asked him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And it's this idea that Jesus gave his life willfully. He is in control perfectly and in perfect submission to his Father. He, he laid down his life for us. So would you join me in singing and reflecting um, as we mourn and as we rejoice for Jesus Christ?
that my Jesus built. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. No gifts, no p- 
power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. His 
to your Grace Point Fellowship. It's my privilege to be able to be asked to share some of my thoughts and, and considerations as we look at Good Friday and the cross. We can pause and remember what the cost of our redemption was. And so I'd like to do that as we consider the instruction that's been given to us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus willingly left the splendor of heaven and presence of the Father to live as a man, to endure rejection, face persecution, and even finally the painful, humiliating death on the cross. He did this so that the cost of our sin could be paid. If we're honest, I believe all of us are very much aware that we fall very short of the holiness of God. Our best thoughts and words and actions don't come near the purity of God's. Scripture makes that very clear. In Romans 3.23 it states, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And again there in Romans Chapter 3, verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is no one righteous. No, not one. So we have a problem. God created us to have fellowship with him, but our sin has separated us from his holiness. Jesus, who knew no sin, the spotless Lamb of God, was treated as a criminal, he was falsely accused, he was beaten, he was mocked, rejected, and ultimately crucified. Crucifixion was a means of execution that was perfected by the Romans to be a slow and excruciatingly painful way to die. It was reserved for the most heinous of offenders, the worst of the worst. It was there on the cross of Calvary that the awful weight and stench of sin was placed on Jesus. The holiness of God requires sin to be removed, erased, atoned for. If God were to ignore sin and pretend that 
it's not there, and allow it to continue without consequence, then he would, in essence, be condoning sin. Sin must be judged, or God's holiness is forfeited. So the price tag for the cleanser that takes away the stain of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, is very plain. For the wages of sin is death. A wage is something that you earn. You have to do something in order to receive a wage. Well, that's both positive and negative as far as consequence. And in this case, the negative is, is that our sin is what we have done and what we have earned is death. But God didn't leave us there with a debt that we could not pay. Instead, he finished that verse by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It takes a sinless offering to scrub away sin, and Jesus is the only one that can do that. He willingly endured the shame and the pain so that he could cry out from the cross, It is finished. The debt has been paid. The reason for his coming has been completed. Having remembered the cross and all that that entailed and all that Jesus accomplished and endured there, we can go back to the text that I started with and that's in Hebrews chapter 12. I'd like now to go to verse 3 because out of the context of verse 2 and all that Jesus endured, verse 3 now has a considerable meaning for us. God states, in verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We have a Savior who understands us and has been there and done that. He endured so much in order to give us everything we need for victory in life and the hope of the future. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 a very favorite passage of mine. In it, God states, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize or sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus understands being tired, overworked. He understands and has felt the unrealistic demands of others being placed upon you. He understands disappointment and physical pain and grief. He's there to respond to our cries for help when we don't know which way to turn or where our next step should be. When we face the sometimes painful, challenging, and rewarding calls for taking up our cross and following Him, He's there, shoulder to shoulder, with us. So in view of such an intimate and fulfilling and powerful and sustaining and comforting walk in relationship with the living Savior, our response should flow out of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and you're very familiar with this passage. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, 
pleasing and perfect will. Jesus abides with us through everything. He is there when we face any kind of issue or problem or challenge. And he was there to strengthen us and to equip us to accomplish mighty things in his precious name. So whatever sacrifice we are called to make can never measure up to his sacrifice for us all. And so on this Good Friday, when we contemplate the cost of our redemption, we remember what Jesus did, but we also remember that he's no longer on the cross. We look forward to Sunday when we celebrate a risen Lord. God accepted his payment on that cross and shows us that by removing Jesus from the tomb, we have a living Redeemer, a living hope, and a living, sustaining, powerful ally through all of the uncertainties of this life. God bless you, Grace Point, and all who are thinking and considering what Jesus has done. May you also bring him into your heart. Love you and wish you a very blessed and peaceful day. Bye-bye. Well, good afternoon, Grace Point Fellowship Church. Pastor Randy here, and I am excited to surf off of what Jim Hare just shared with us a moment ago as he focused our attention on the cross and he talked about sacrifice. In just a, a few moments at the end of my time with you, I'm going to invite you to join me in a time of partaking of communion. So hopefully you've gotten this cue already through email or through another Facebook post. But uh, if not, you can just find a little bit of bread in your house and some juice, grape juice. If you don't have that, you can use any kind of liquid. If you didn't know this, uh, in the early church, uh, the church gathered in homes. <laughs> what we're doing now in finding an anomaly was a regularity for the early church. And when they met in homes, uh, they would have a meal together. And they called them love feasts. And in the context of their love feast, they would actually take communion. And they would take the cup and the bread and they'd break it. And they would remember uh, how Jesus did this. And they remember his words. And we're going to hear those words in just a moment, but I wanted to give you the broader context of what that passage is taken from in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to bring it to you because here's the deal. Uh, we know that this is a difficult, difficult crisis. It, it goes without saying. But as we look at Scripture and how God deals with his people, he never allows a crisis without a desire to shape the character of his people. And as we're working through this difficult time together, there is something that God is saying to us in this, and he's almost like he's saying, pay attention. And we got to get this, because if we don't get this, I'm concerned for what else he might allow to come upon the church if we don't. So we really need to listen up to these words, and we need to listen up to God's voice during this difficult time so we can capture what is it that God is trying to communicate to us as his church. And there's basically four kinds of believers that are um, going to come out of this particular trial. And I, I want to talk to you about those four, because at the end of this, we're all going to have to decide which one of those four are we going to become. And the first kind are people that are, are going to come out of this even more selfish and more self-centered than they were going into this difficult time, this COVID crisis. And what I mean by that is that this crisis is going to cause them to be more focused on themselves, uh, more concerned about getting their needs met, more concerned about um, what uh, can be done for them, there's going to be more of a scramble to get everything that they can get in this world and in this life because 
uh, they really haven't been pressing into Jesus and clinging to him. They haven't really believed that Jesus is all that they need. They've just been singing it and saying that God is all that they need. Um, but they haven't really let it sink from their head to their hearts. And so they're going to become more selfish, more entitled, expect the church to do even more for them as they continue on with this sort of uh, customer-consumer mindset of church instead of a communer mindset, which is what God calls us to. And so some people are going to become more selfish and more self-centered even within the church. Then the second kind of people are those that are they're going to become more stressed out. Um, this is going to create more fear in them. And ultimately that's going to be because they haven't truly learned how to trust that God is in control. And so there are a lot of things that cause fear in our lives. And you've heard me preach on this. Some of these things are real things. They are things that um, should cause fear in our lives because it's that sense of fear that God has given to us that can protect us and help us to respond in a way that could save our lives. But then there's um, perceived fear. And there's been a lot more perceived fear in this from believers even who have not really learned that God is their good shepherd. God wants you to learn this lesson now through this COVID crisis that you can press into him, you can cling to him, you can come to him, you can feel his presence like a sheep feels the presence of a good shepherd. And if we don't learn that lesson, we're going to come through this even more stressed out. Why is that? Because we're going to be reminded that it's a whole lot more out of our control than what we already knew. I was already taught that this crisis it could be coming in waves, and it might be a seasonal thing like the flu, um, especially if we don't get a vaccine. So God is trying to teach his church and his people to fear not, to look to him as the good shepherd, to cling to him, that we can have a sense of supernatural peace that washes over us and prevails amongst the people that we interact with, that he would get the glory, that they would say, what is it about you? How do you keep calm? When everybody else seems so panicked, how do you find peace? Uh, but if we don't learn to cling to God, then we're going to be more stressed out. The third kind of person are those who are going to become more cynical. They're going to become more suspicious. They're going to sneer more. They're going to become more sarcastic because that's going to be their coping method. It's going to be like, oh, here we go again. And they're going to bring that attitude in the church, just sort of cynical, sneering. Oh, we've tried that again. And look, we just ended up with this situation. Why? Because, again, feeling out of control, feeling like no matter what we do, it's really not going to make a difference. And that's my concern for us, church. It's like if we do not learn what God was teaching to the Corinthian church here through Paul's writings, um, but we're going to end up a lot like the Corinthian church, a church that had everything going for it in terms of a wealth, in terms of uh, being a place of prominence, uh, in terms of being a place of, uh, 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 of uh, influence, that we would have all these things going for us and not learn how to harness it to further the mission of the church. And so God has amazing words for the church then and by extension the church today. So that we don't go on becoming more selfish, more stressed out, and more cynical than we were before going into this crisis. And so I'm going to read for you the passage, and you're going to see these three things. And then I'm going to talk to you about what God's solution is. So Paul writes, beginning in verse 17, In the following directives I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent I believe. So he says, you guys are getting together and you're fighting amongst yourselves. Why? Because you're stressed out? Because you're self-centered? Because you're cynical? And he goes, no doubt there have to be uh, differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. He said, you guys have gotten so selfish that when you get to the house where you're going to have this love feast, where you're going to have a house church meeting, you're not waiting for those who are more hungry, who are more hurting, who are poor, who can't afford meat and to eat a lot of food. You're just gobbling it all up for yourselves and not leaving anything for those who actually need it the most. And you're missing out on the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be generous because you've become selfish. 
And it goes on to say, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And then he talks about that sacred moment where Jesus is in the upper room with selfish, cynical, stressed out people. They're called the 12 disciples. And all of a sudden you realize, gosh, they're a lot like us. And in that moment, in that sacred, holy moment in the upper room, Jesus, it says the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And then he goes on to say, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So he says, therefore, everyone should examine himself. Examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. In other words, a lot of you have died. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when we eat and gather together to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. What's he saying? He's saying, don't be so selfish. Don't be so stressed out. Don't be so cynical and suspicious of other people. Do what Jesus did and be sacrificial. How do you be sacrificial? You surrender what you thought you had a right to. You, you surrender what your entitlements are. You surrender your privileges for the sake of another. You surrender your preferences. You get outside of yourself and you sacrifice. Jim talked about sacrifice. Did you know that he's a Marine? He fought in Kasem in Vietnam for our freedoms. He knows a lot about sacrifice. Jesus said, be like that. Be willing to give of yourselves to other people the way that Jesus gave himself for you. And so in that upper room, and if you would take your elements now, the cup, and the bread. In that context of selfishness, and people stressed out, and people being cynical to the point where they're bickering in the upper room about which one of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. In that moment, Jesus put a cloth around his waist and a small basin of water, and he knelt down and he washes the disciples' feet, those stinking feet that had walked in those sandals for miles and miles, one after the other, kneels down in this upper room on his knees, washing their feet to remind them that those who come through adversity and calamity are those who learn about surrender and sacrifice. So, beloved, in this context, in the midst of this crisis, on this day, Good Friday, I invite you to join me. Not just in taking of these elements, but beyond this, to lay down your rights, to lay down your entitlements, to lay down your privileges, to lay down your preferences, to stop bickering among one another in your household where you felt like there's been... Uh, a moment of friction, and to love and to serve and to sacrifice. And in so doing, we'll find ourselves coming through this like Jesus. Not bitter, but better. And so with that being said, Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Let's take and eat.
Likewise, it says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he looked at those disciples, those selfish, stressed out, cynical disciples, and he said, let me tell you about this cup. This cup represents the blood, not just any blood, but my blood that's going to be given on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And so he said, take and drink in remembrance of me. Because that every time you do, you're reminded of not only the sacrifice of Jesus, but that he is coming again. So let's take and drink. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that this simple bread and this juice that we hold in our hands reminds us of something incredibly profound. That Lord Jesus, as Romans 5 8 says, that while we were still yet sinners, you died for us. God, you saw us in our wretched estate. And seeing us slimy and sinful and selfish and stressed out because we weren't trusting you and cynical, you sent yourself by the directive of your Father to this earth to die a terrible death on a cross, arms stretched out, as if to say, I love you this much, even as Roman soldiers were sneering and casting lots for your clothing, and you lay there on the cross, Lord. Still you look down, and you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh God, help us to be more like to reach out to those in our home with the heart of Jesus and to say, I forgive you. I know you don't know all that you're doing. You're stressed out. You're under the strain of this virus. Emotions are running high. But I forgive you, for I have been forgiven. And Lord Jesus, as we exercise our forgiveness, as we're huddled up together in our homes, would you be glorified in our word and in our deeds? And would you shape our character that we would learn the lesson that you are teaching us through this crisis and that your church, this church that we call Grace Point Fellowship and beyond, would shine even brighter in the darkness of this world, drawing even more people to find the hope that only can be found in you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, Good Friday special time of devotion and i pray that uh, as we end our time now that you will just take a little extra time to reflect upon the cross to think about um, the gravity of your sin um, to think about the the price that was necessary to pay so that you could be forgiven and I, I don't say that because I want you to think of me as the pastor of doom and gloom, but I say that because um, God wants us to go through a process every year of remembering the gravity of our sin so that when Sunday comes, we can celebrate to even greater extents the grace of God um, that forgives us of our sin. And so Friday then sets us up for a greater celebration on Sunday. So I'm going to leave you in silence, and the end of this video will end in silence as a way to encourage you to be reverent and reflective in this very precious time that we're spending together uh, online, so that when we gather again on Sunday, our hearts would be more prepared to celebrate that we have salvation from the Lord Jesus and that we are cleansed of our sins.